It is now my great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Thomas F. McClarty III, known to most as Mac McClarty, who has distinguished record of business leadership and public service. He served as Chief of Staff for the President and Special Envoy for Americas under President Bill Clinton. He also served as advisor to Presidents George H. W. Bush and Jimmy Carter. He is currently President and CEO of McClurdy Associates, an international consulting firm. Please welcome Mark McClurdy. Elia, thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, I am delighted and indeed honored to be part of this program tonight, and I am particularly uh, feel a, a privilege to be associated with the dialogue for many years. Before I get to my duties at hand, let me acknowledge both Michael Shifter and Ambassador Carla Hills for their continuing persevering and capable leadership. I think the dialogue is just getting stronger with each passing year, building on a very firm foundation that we just heard about. I certainly want to acknowledge and add my congratulations to the other honorees tonight, all well-deserving. I would be remiss if I did not say just a few words about my longtime and dear friend Luis Alberto Moreno, who is a force and a force for good. Luis, it's good to always be with you. Tonight, I have the great honor of introducing this year's Lifetime Achievement Awardee. A remarkable leader, thinker, and statesman. Fernando Enrique Cardoso. Now, Mr. President, I know you can hear me there backstage, and this is not the first time that I have had the privilege to be in this role, but I'm not the least bit worried about finding new material about you, given your remarkable accomplishments and my regard and respect for you. In fact, I think I could just do this every week. <laughs> I think it is especially fitting to honor President Gordoso tonight, as Michael said, because he was there at the beginning. In fact, Abe Lowenthal once commented to me, the first person that he really visited about in some detail about the dialogue, along with Saul Linowitz, who was such a great mentor and friend to so many of us, was Fernando Enrique. President Gardoso has continued to be a key contributor to the dialogue for so many years and serves currently as Emeritus Chair. As many of you in this room tonight know, President Gardoso entitled his memoir, The Accidental President of Brazil. He began his career not as a politician, but as has already been noted, as a sociologist. He was exiled by the military regime. But upon his return, he swiftly made his mark as a public servant, rising from senator to finance minister to president in just a dozen years. Of course, at the time of his presidential campaign, he didn't know how that chapter might unfold. And he wrote in his memoir, and I quote, democracy has been a disaster so far. I viewed running for president as exactly the sort of accident one that crosses the street chooses to avoid. But he won that election, as all of you know, and went on to serve a second term. He was the right person at the right time to lead Brazil. With the support of the courageous people of Brazil, he presided over a remarkable period where skyrocketing inflation was brought under control. Millions of Brazilians were lifted out of poverty. The number of students not attending school dropped to 3% and college enrollments more than doubled. And Brazil was internationally recognized for their achievements in health care. In short, President Cardoso helped his extraordinary country assume its rightful place on the world stage. And in a poll shortly after he left office, Brazilians declared that he was the best president in their history. As the New York Times accurately put it, Mr. Cardoso ended his career as he began, began it with the seamless transition 
of power, serving as Brazil's great stabilizer, as the Times put it. The president continues to be so engaged around the world in issues of public health, democracy building, drug policy, and development. I would be remiss if I did not add it has been a personal privilege to work with him both during my time in government and in more recent years. In sum, Fernando Cardo uh, Henrique Cardoso is a person of integrity, principle, intellect, perseverance, congeni congeniality, and reason. And I can't imagine anyone more deserving of this year's Dialogues Lifetime Achievement Award. Please join me in welcoming President Fernando Enrique Cardoso. Good night. Let me say, after all, that what, what has been said by Ambassador McCarthy came from his generosity and friendship. Thank you very much for being tonight with us. And I am uh, grateful to the Inter-American Dialogue for the prize that has been given to me. My connections with this institution go back into the past, and my admiration for it only grows with the passing of time. Arguably, it may well be the most influential organization in Washington when what is at stake are the hemispherical relations, and this applies to a variety of sectors, from the social to the economic, but especially regard politics. I spread, therefore, my gratitude to Michael Schifter, and in doing so, I extend my praise to all previous executive directors and core chairs, to all of them, as well as to the members of Inter-American Dialogue. I am really grateful for the prize and for the conviviality they have offered me over the years, decades, in fact. Since I became associated with the Dialogue, I was its core chair alongside with Carla Hills, who spoke so well and so enthusiastic tonight. And I came to appreciate its steady commitment to illuminate what is happening in the Americas and the ways and means through which we may join forces in favor of a democratic, peaceful, and more prosperous world. I would like now to seize the occasion to make two or three comments about teams which continue to challenge us. I will start by the broader of them, the impact of globalization and the power shift in today's world. As you know, the emergence of China as a superpower is a blinding fact. Equally evident to all are the variations, not to say the vagaries, of the foreign policy of the United States administration. Since the Cold War and the beginning of the policy of peaceful coexistence, I cannot recall a time more fraught with disquiet and uncertainty. In the early 70s, the, the point is that I'm an old man, so I remember quite well, decades ago, <laughs> in the early 70s, led by the Nixon Kissinger duo, the United States realized that with Deng Xiaoping a later with the Chinese policy of harmonious coexistence, there will be a space for the preservation of peace and for the enlargement of global prosperity. With the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Empire, conditions were given for an economically integrated world thanks to the technological innovations and ensuring globalization with the Americas as the driving force. The perception we have today is that with Donald Trump and Xi Jinping, 
this scenario may change. I do not anticipate the emergency of openly unfriendly relationship leading to confrontation, but a partial withdrawal on the United States within itself, of the United States within itself, as if the fulfillment of the country's exceptional destiny would be more dependent upon inter internal prosperity and the growth of its economy than with the global role as a civilizing hegemon. Meanwhile, the Chinese, without abandoning the rhetoric that they, wi they wish to escape from the Thucydides trap, are increasingly seeing themselves as one of the pillars of the global order. Instead of an isolationist China, we tend to have a more active China in the international level, and who knows, closer to Europe and by extension to Russia. What is the meaning of the One Road, One Belt initiative? The Chinese are attentive, and rightly so, to their needs in terms of foodstuff and oil. Mistrustful of the United States, whose navy is the only one truly global, they flee, they flee from the seas and search for dry land as a safer alternative in case of need, which does not imply the abandon of trans-Pacific connections. After having explored the possibilities for their strategic goals in Africa, the Chinese are now looking to Eurasia and with, why not also the South America. I never forgot what Lee Kuan Yu all once told me in Prague. They said, he said, the Chinese military have long studied the Second World War and came to the conclusion that the Germans lost it because they did not have access to oil. This is not to say that the Chinese want or expect a war, but if it happens, the Latins used to say, civis passen parabello, which means in English, if you want peace, prepare for the war. Independently from the view of the Chinese, the bellicose fervor of North Korea is not leading this country to become a mini nuclear power. The North Koreans are well aware that nothing dramatic happening in India and in Pakistan after the American and the United Nations protests for their acquisition of nuclear power. Why would the Chinese play the role of fireman in North Korea if the Americans offered their umbrella to protect South Korea and Japan and accepted the fact that the Indian subcontinent had gone nuclear? Well, let us have a look now at Latin America. In such a context, how will the economically stronger countries of the region react to the American government builds a, way, a wall, wall to contain the migration from Mexico and other countries, and if, on the other hand, the Chinese increase their investments in Brazil, in Argentina, and elsewhere. They will respond, obviously, in accordance with their interests, and not because they have an American vision. With a significant difference, the Chinese have a strategic vision orienting their action and us, Latin Americans, we are still learning to call in this matter. This would also affect hemispheric interconnections and incite nationalistic feelings. If in the recent past an integrated Europe served as an antidote for local passions, what will be the impact of a post-Brexit and post-Catalan Europe? At the time, when we were building the Mercosur and the Clinton administration came up with the FTAA, Latin Americans, without abandoning the Mercosur, the Andean Pact, or the Central American integration, looked at the European community as a mirror. We saw in it an element of positive counterbalance to the American influence. Now that ultranationalist and eventually populist forces are gathering strength both in Europe and the United States, how shall we react? Latin American populism was at least a driver of social integration for the downtrodden masses 
while the present European or American populism reacts negatively to mass migration. He does not believe in the possibilities of economic success and is, of a, is a kind of regressive nature with eyes turned to the past, not to the future. My sense is that in today's global scenario, given the current policies of the American government and the strategic interests of China, the countries of the hemisphere are confronted with some hard choices. The dialogue might engage in this debate and hopefully bring to light the links between the moves of the players in many levels of a global power board. Finally, and not to overbear you, I would like to make one further consideration. All this affects the development of democracy in our region. Even though the crisis of representative democracy touched all the Western countries in our continent, it has some very specific configurations. By and large, there is a widespread crisis of trust between people and those in power. In Latin America, the extension of democracy went hand in hand in many countries with old practices of patronage and populism. Often, it degenerates into a system that sustains corruption when it is not sustained by it, as we have seen recently in my country. I do not need to go into detail on this. In any case, there is something which is in common to the democrat democratic crisis in the Western world. Our institutions of government were inspired by Montesquieu with the national notion of separation of powers. Rousseau followed another route, even though the notion of general will once in a while troubles the, the democratic path in Latin America in the case in which this interpretation becomes the rationale for clinging to power as demonstrates Venezuela. The belief well expressed by the founding fathers that freedom is a right intrinsic to people whose limit extends to the point in which one's freedom interferes with the freedom of another has always been a cornerstone of the liberal democratic uh, regimes implanted in the hemisphere and also of those with a conservative orientation. Despite the notion of natural law espoused by Locke and others, there was no denial that the spirit of freedom and the respect of the rule of law had social roots in community or in religion for some, in the social class and in political party for others. Pure liberalism hardly existed in Latin America, except in some few moments. By and large, even its heralds, confronted with the huge level of inequality in society, had to pay attention to the social reality. With or without populism, people's basic needs were necessary ingredients of democratic political discourse. Well, the dynamic of contemporary societies imploded the traditional forms of sociability and cohesion. Neither class nor community or religion are the only fundamental pillars for life in society. Other forms of sociability, some of them still evolving, are behind the depths of trust between people and institutions. Now, new technologies increase productivity, consequently increase the accumulation of process especially in the financial sector, but do not generate employment in the same proportion. People have access to information and relate to each other direct through social networks that transcend national borders. In the globalized world, fear and insecurity replace the trust that community, religion, or class solidarity with parts in their ideology offered in the modern world. It was in such a world that Western democracy gained its strength and scope from the 19th century up to the last century. In the last quarter of the 20th century, we entered in a new era that for lack of a better name, I will call contemporary era. The contemporary era is driven by new modes of production, new forms of communication, new patterns of sociability, a new forms of political representation in which 
the politics of identity prevail over the politics of classes. It is in this new landscape that the specter of job insecurity in the future materialize as well as the profile of a society defined by growing inequalities. In this address, I cannot go beyond outline these trends without analyzing them more deeply or grounding my perception in facts. But Donald Trump's election and the Brexit are a clear expression of the sense of fear and loss felt by people confronted with a deterioration of their well-being being, and quality of life. The same happened at the last presidential election in France, when large sectors of the working class, who in the past have, had always voted for left, migrating to the far left, the right. The concepts of left and right are no longer capable of accounting for political identities. Leaders and measures like those used by Donald Trump to secure the Rust Belt vote are driving the masses in the West more than political parties and the ideology consistent with the traditional social basis. At this point in time, we can clearly discern the ruins of the world we had built and only glimpse the shadows of the emerging contemporary societies. I would nonetheless conclude on a hopeful note. The challenges we have to face do not exonerate us from continuing to search for, as you used to call, viable utopias, a contradiction in terms, in line with our ideals of peace in the world, quality of life for those who do not have it and democratic rules to regulate power and the powerful. Our dialogue is well equipped to tackle these issues, mobilizing the most thoughtful and influential leaders in the hemisphere in the quest of our ideals. Gradually, we will see ever more clearly where today's world is moving to. Let us continue to dedicate ourselves to strength in the world of tomorrow, the actors and actions that we deem the best. It is because of my trust in the dialogue's ability to act as an aggregator that humbly in receiving this tribute, I feel the emotion of being with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>